People sometimes ask me, as an historian, what is history for? What is its function? Particularly since it's what I call a crippled discipline, a discipline that can't get at the truth. We'll never have a complete and clear record of the human past, and we can't get into the minds of our historical characters. We can't resurrect them from the grave and put them on the Freudian couch and psychoanalyze them. Even if they leave memoirs, those memoirs are liable to be slanted and faulted. And the historian himself is a brainwasher in a sense, in that he or she has his own point of view and perspective. Yet, given all these limitations, I would argue that history is utterly essential, essential to making us human. It separates us from the animals. How is that? Human beings interact with their environment, and out of that interaction comes a culture. And what history is, is our memory, our collective memory of that culture. It puts us in touch with our past. And by putting us in touch with our past, our past ceaselessly influences us and even haunts us. A Biography of America is a series of 26 half-hour programs that tells the American story through narrative lecture, discussion, American and debate. It didn't happen because it is inconceivable. It is a panorama of American events, lives, ideas, voices. A team of historians came together to think through and shape the series. Let's stand up for freedom together. I'd like to start out talking a little bit about what's distinctive about what we're trying to do. It's a biography of America. What does that mean? So it won't be a grab bag of everything. It can't. In be. fashioning this series, we went out and tried to get the best historians we could. Of the single moment. I think the telling details, those particular. We pick people which, who are you know, great storytellers, scholars. To understand what's distinctive about the past is implicitly to know what's distinctive about the present. Pauline Mayer, for example, is our revolutionary historian, and, and she's absolutely at the top of her game. She's a brilliant historian, and she brings to life the whole period of the American Revolution, the constitutional period. But it's the distinction of the past, I think, that makes the story interesting. The, 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 the biography of America is not pretending that biography is any more neutral and objective and detached than anything else. I mean, we're making choices, we're making selections. We're we have Lou Mazur, who's an intellectual historian, but also does social history. And Lou has a wonderful feel for the 19th century, and he's done some brilliant lectures, I think, for us on the reform period during the Jacksonian era. As Emerson has said, right, history rightly understood is biography. biography right. Right. And so it really comes down also to our definition of history. Uh, my students are always enraptured with the notion of success. But failure is often far more interesting and far more <laughs> revealing. Waldo Martin explains, I think, cogently, clearly, the motivating causes for the Civil War. We bring Waldo back again, and he traces what happened to the South after the Civil War and takes a look at it from a long-range perspective. Um, we have Douglas Brinkley. It seems to me to say we're looking at the story of America from an, in, a, in a narrative fashion that kind of like a biography goes chronologically, but also, as the best biographies do, talk about the life and times, and times of yeah. America. And he has a special love for Theodore Roosevelt and has done a real nice lecture for us on, on the progressive period on Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, people he's both you know, acutely familiar with. Uh, Doug's also done the Great Depression. Thomas Wolfe said there are a billion forms of America, and just when you think you're coming to some new realization, you realize, well, what do we really know about the Shoshone's relationship to the Sioux? I really like stupid questions. Me too. And I had three stupid questions that I came to this project with. Where is America? Who counts as American? And what counts as American? Our Western historian is Virginia Sharp. She's been great. She pinch hits all over the place and has helped us so much. She asks the big questions. She, she fills in the spaces for us. She's done a terrific lecture on the American West. Like the first thing you have to know about history is that the people we're talking about weren't always dead. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, they weren't always dead. They were alive. You know, a lot of them. At any one point in time, we're thinking of the past, the present, and the future. You're sitting here. You're thinking about what you're going to do next, what you're doing now, and what you just did. And you're always thinking like that.
That's historical thinking. It's the best kind of thinking where the present is informed by the past and shaped past. You know, a long time ago, my grandfather told me he was a Slovak immigrant who had no education. He said, always remember, you are what you have been. Never forget that. And, and it's a lesson I've never forgotten. That's what history means to me. Today, on a biography of America, New World Encounters. We begin with that rarest of things, a world-transforming event. It's 2 o'clock in the morning, October 12, 1492. Three Spanish ships have been at sea for 33 days. Christopher Columbus has gambled that by sailing west into the unknown Atlantic, he'll reach Asia, opening a blue water trade route to China, then the world's greatest civilization. Columbus is on the flagship Santa Maria when a lookout on the Pinta spots a white cliff in the moonlight and shouts, Tierra, Tierra. That moment was the beginning of a new age of world history. A knowledgeable person in 1492 knew the Earth was round, but that person's world had only three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and they were located around the landlocked Mediterranean. Christopher Columbus changed that forever. Columbus went to his death convinced he'd landed somewhere in Asia, but others suspected he'd found what Shakespeare called a brave new world. The Vikings had landed in North America more than 500 years before Columbus, but hadn't followed up their discovery. Spain did, and its discovery set loose creative energies all over Europe. Columbus's landfall in the Bahamas began one of the most momentous cultural encounters in history. It reunited two worlds, two peoples, who lived apart for tens of thousands of years, and it created the modern Atlantic community. Trade and enterprise expanded beyond all reckoning, and even the world's food would never be the same. In 1492, no one in Ireland had ever tasted a potato, and Italians ate pasta without tomato sauce. Nor had the Indians Columbus encountered ever tasted an onion, a peach, a pear, an orange, or a banana, or anything made with rice, wheat, or sugar. And they'd never seen a horse, a cow, a pig, a goat, a chicken, or even a honeybee. Europeans enriched this cultural exchange by taking back with them a host of plants beside the tomato and the white potato. They took back squash and cocoa, beans and corn, avocados and pineapples, chili peppers and peanuts, as well as two non-food plants, tobacco and cotton, which would sustain wealthy and brutally exploitive slave systems in the New World. Columbus's voyages, as we'll see, changed the global economy and ecosystems in other and sometimes catastrophic ways. But the point I want to make here is that the originator of what has been called the Columbian Exchange wasn't the real discoverer of America, and that American history doesn't begin in 1492. It begins in the Ice Age, approximately 30,000 years ago. We may never know precisely when our history begins or who were the first people to step foot on the land we call America. But what we do know is that at least one group of original discoverers were Stone Age hunting bands from Asia. They migrated from Siberia to Alaska across a land bridge that appeared with massive sheets of ice, captured the seawater of the Bering Strait, exposing the dry ocean floor. These earlier American immigrants were searching for game, and their search took them through corridors created by towering walls of blue ice. Others may have entered the continent over the ice flows from the east, in an almost unfathomable feat of endurance and navigational skill. Still, the continent was vast and unpopulated prior to the arrival of these people. So wherever they migrated, when they got there, they were utterly alone. Then, almost 10,000 years later, the ice melted, the sea rose up again, the land bridge disappeared, and they were cut off from the rest of the planet. For thousands of years, these Stone Age hunting bands lived nomadic lives. But about 9,000 years ago, people in the highlands of Central America began cultivating beans, squash, and corn, and that changed everything. These first part-time farmers began over a period of thousands of years to live close to their fields, and they started making potteries that store their surplus. Village life was born, humans began to settle down, and corn became the foundation of a new, more complex civilization. Two of the greatest of these corn-based civilizations grew up before Europe emerged from the Dark Ages. At Chaco Canyon, 
in northwestern New Mexico, the Anastasi Indians harness scarce water with earthen dams and irrigation systems to turn the desert floor into a garden of squash and corn. And their architects built magnificent multi-storied apartments and 400 miles of arrow-straight roads to surrounding communities. When Chaco Canyon was abandoned, some of its master builders migrated 100 miles north to Mesa Verde. There, in huge caves in the canyon walls, they built communal houses so fantastic that the places have been called the Disneyland of American archaeology. Today, these are both active archaeological sites, but we may never know why the Anastasi left first Chaco Canyon and then Mesa Verde. When the Spaniards arrived, they were both empty places. About the time the Anastasi were shaping their desert culture, the Mississippian, or mound-building people, were living in Cahokia, a sprawling urban cluster just across the Mississippi River from present-day St. Louis. The pharaoh-like rulers of Cahokia lived atop colossal man-made earthen mounds, one of them with a base larger than any Egyptian pyramid. By the 13th century, Cahokia had a population of perhaps 30,000 people and a trading network encompassing the entire Mississippi River basin. When the Spaniards moved into the southeastern United States, they encountered what was left of Mississippian civilization. The lands occupied by these people and further west, the descendants of the Anastasi, were areas of North America that Spain first penetrated. The invaders had decisive advantages over those they invaded. North American Indians still lived in the Stone Age and had only one four-legged domestic animal, the dog, while the Spanish conquistadors had armor, powerful steel swords, guns, and explosives. And they had the horse, which gave them tremendous mobility and terrified the Indians who had never seen such a fearsome beast. They also had trained war dogs, greyhounds that could chew the face off a man. But the Spaniards' most powerful weapons were invisible killers they brought with them in their blood and breath, infectious diseases. Because they'd been isolated from the rest of the world, the Indians had no immunity to European diseases such as smallpox, diphtheria, influenza, and cholera. Common childhood diseases like measles and mumps hit them with ferocious force. Smallpox alone could wipe out an entire tribe in one harrowing visitation, partly because it struck almost everyone at the same time, leaving no one to tend to the victims. In 1520, there were approximately 25 million people in Mexico. Eighty years later, there were about 1.3 million, largely because of European diseases. It's no wonder the invasion of North America has been called the greatest demographic disaster in the history of the world. The Spanish had yet another advantage over the Indians, a set of beliefs ideally suited for conquest. In 1492, Spain had just completed a seven-century-long war to drive the Moors out of Iberia. This Catholic crusade nourished a warrior culture among the lesser nobility of Castile, and they carried it to the Americas, convinced they had a divine mandate to reduce the New World infidels into submission. Columbus also saw himself as an agent of God's purpose. In his lust for gold and in the name of his God, he enslaved and killed Indians all over the Caribbean. But Columbus was also a product of the Renaissance spirit, a medievalist with many modern instincts. He was from Genoa, one of the founding cities of European capitalism and a center of oceanic trade and cartography. A city of the sea, it formed him and launched him as a merchant mariner. Columbus had read Marco Polo, the beginning of his obsession with China, and he had corresponded with the great Florentine geographer Paolo Toscanelli to get verification for his theory that he could easily reach Asia by sailing westward. Toscanelli confirmed Columbus's notion that Japan was only 3,000 nautical miles west of the Canary Islands. The great geographer was off by 10,000 miles. But that spectacular error gave Columbus the confidence to set out for China and Japan. Luckily, Two huge continents blocked his way, or he and his men would have died horribly on the open sea. Columbus might have been a bad geographer, but he was a crack mariner. In discovering America, he discovered as well the clockwise motion of winds and currents that would take him and every smart sailor after him to and from the America. The Renaissance writers and artists celebrated individual accomplishment, and Columbus's first voyage was one of the great maritime feats of any age. The point here is that Columbus was too closely associated with new developments in trade and navigational science to place him with medieval-like knights of the Reconquista. If you want the prototypical conquistador, your man isn't Columbus. It's Hernando de Soto. 
Soto, as he was known in his time, became the first European to penetrate far into the interior of North America. In 1539 to 1543, his army of 600 men traveled 4,000 miles, twice the distance later covered by Lewis and Clark. Soto was a toughened veteran of the Spanish conquest in Peru. He'd come to the Americas at the age of 14, the son of an impoverished squire, and returned to Spain a rich man and with a reputation for killing Indians for sport. He could have retired in splendor, but he wanted more, more gold, more glory. So he got a commission from the crown to organize a voyage into unknown North America. His aim, to find another Inca-style empire. After landing on the west coast of Florida, he moved north, traveling in princely splendor. His retinue included a steward, two toastmasters, a butler, a pastry cook, two falconers, eight grooms, five musicians, two jugglers, and innumerable bearers and bodyguards. He passed through 10 future states of the United States. He went up into the Carolinas, across the Appalachians, and down through parts of Tennessee, Alabama, and Mississippi, coming on the Mississippi River near Memphis. Then he pushed on into Arkansas before turning back to the Mississippi when he couldn't find rich civilizations to plunder. There, on the banks of the river, he came down with a fever and died. Freed from his obsession, his men dumped his body into the river and made it back to Mexico in ships made of logs, the local Indians in hot pursuit. There's a splendid painting of DeSoto by William Henry Powell in a panel in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol. Soto is on a white stallion, and he's decked out in satin and glistening armor, as are his soldiers and lieutenants, as they ride toward the great river Soto has discovered. The near-naked Indians are in supplicating positions, in fear and awe of the conquering captain. The painting's a beautiful lie. First of all, Soto wasn't the first European to discover the Mississippi. The mouth of the river was first sighted in 1519 by another Spanish explorer, Alvarez de Pineda. And when Soto and his army reached the Mississippi, they didn't look anything like the way we see them in this painting. They were a starving band and had been decimated by sickness and Indian attacks. Soto had buried almost half his men, and the walking wounded were carrying the mortally wounded in makeshift slings. A few men still wore European clothes, but most were dressed like Indians and they saw the big river in front of them not as some magnificent discovery, but as one more damn obstacle to surmount. The fighting in the southeast had been incredibly ferocious. Everywhere DeSoto went, he demanded food, clothing, and women for his sex-starved men. When threats and diplomacy didn't work, he went on hair-raising killing sprees. But the Indians fought back with suicidal determination. They weren't the supplicants in Powell's paintings. In the walled city of Mabila, in present-day Alabama, Atahachi women fought side by side with their men in what was one of the bloodiest encounters in five centuries of warfare between Europeans and Indians. Soto's invasion and the diseases his men left in its wake led to the destruction of most of what was left of Mississippian culture. Had Soto been more interested in settlement than conquest, the rich agricultural lands he passed through might have been claimed permanently by Spain, and today they'd be speaking Spanish all over Dixie. As Soto was pushing beyond the Mississippi, another Spanish explorer, Francisco Vasquez de Coronado, was moving across the continent from the other direction. At one point, without knowing it, the two explorers came within 300 miles of each other. Coronado headed out from Mexico City with an enormous expeditionary force, looking for cities of silver. But when he entered the lands of the Pueblo Indians, the descendants of the Anastasi, he found nothing but towns of adobe and stone. Here he met resistance, but crushed it quickly and pushed on, sending exploring parties all over the Southwest, across Arizona to the Grand Canyon and beyond into California. Then, hearing from an Indian guide that there was a rich city called Quivera, far to the north, he followed the guide in search of it. When he reached Quivera in northern Kansas, all he found were the beehive-shaped huts of the primitive Wichita Indians and an endless sea of grass filled with buffalo. Coronado saw land and people of no value, but for those with a sense of irony, this is a rich moment. The Indians of the plains who stood staring in wonderment at Coronado's mounted warriors were seeing for the first time the animal that would eventually revolutionize their lives. Disgusted by these people who drank buffalo blood, Coronado turned back toward Mexico, but not before ordering the strangulation of his Indian guide. 
For almost 60 years, only a handful of white men ventured back into Pueblo country. Then, in 1598, new rumors reached Mexico City of rich mines along the Rio Grande, and Juan de Oñate was sent from New Mexico with an expedition of soldiers and settlers. This time, the Spanish stayed. The first resistance occurred at Acoma, a pueblo built on top of a spectacular 400-foot-high mesa. When Spanish troops stopped there and demanded food, the warriors attacked them, killing 16 soldiers, including Oñate's nephew. Oñate retaliated with chilling brutality. A party of soldiers secretly dragged a cannon up the rock face at the rear of the mesa, turned it on the town, and blasted away. In three days of fighting, the Spanish leveled Acoma and killed 800 of its people. Then Oñate staged a public mutilation, chopping one foot off every surviving young man. But Oñate was as unsuccessful as Coronado in finding rich mines and was soon recalled to Mexico City. At this point, two years before the English founded Jamestown, the crown was about to abandon New Mexico. But the powerful Franciscan order wanted it for missionary territory. So the friars were allowed to stay with crown protection to establish a Catholic theocracy among the pueblos. The age of military conquest ended. The religious and cultural conquest began. The friars taught the Indians the Spanish language and Spanish ways and tried to eradicate Indian religion and culture. When Indians resisted conversion or strayed from the faith, the soldiers were called in to intimidate or punish them. Then repression ignited rebellion. Drought and starvation struck the Pueblo communities, and they came under increasing attack from their traditional enemies, the Apaches and the Navajo. All the while, the colony of some 3,000 Spanish settlers continued to illegally extract labor and tribute from the Indians. In 1680, Pope, a medicine man who had been whipped for practicing witchcraft, led a lightning attack on the Spanish settlements. In three weeks, the Pueblo Indians killed 400 foreigners and drove the rest of them out of New Mexico. The mutilated bodies of the priests were smeared with human excrement and thrown over the altars of their desecrated churches. At Acoma, the missionary father was hurled to his death from the top of the mesa. It was one of the most successful Indian resistance movements in American history, but the Pueblos couldn't maintain their independence for long. Unity dissolved because Pope demanded an end to all things Spanish, and the Pueblos had come to depend on Spanish farming technology and on Spanish goats, sheep, cattle, pigs, and horses. So when Diego de Vargas marched to New Mexico to reconquer it, it was an easier task than he'd imagined. There was one uprising, then there were no more. The Spanish settlers and soldiers helped keep the peace by reducing their demands for Indian labor and by marrying Indian wives. And the Franciscans learned to tolerate Pueblo religious practices. In the 17th century, New Mexico and the fortified town of St. Augustine on the east coast of Florida were Spain's only North American colonies. Both served as buffer states in Florida against the English in Georgia and the Carolinas, and in New Mexico against the French who from their base in Canada had claimed the entire Mississippi Valley. France's North American empire, however, was vastly different from Spain's in purpose and practice. The French were in North America primarily for commerce, not colonization. They wanted to control the lucrative fur trade, and to get furs, they made alliances with the Indians. They didn't want Indian lands or labor, and the Jesuit missionaries were amazingly tolerant and highly successful in dealing with the Indians. As were the French fur traders, who married into Indian families and lived with natives in mixed bloods at frontier trading posts. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. In 1600, Spain was the only European nation with colonies in North America. Samuel de Champlain did not yet establish a French settlement at Quebec, and Protestant England, under Queen Elizabeth, had tried and failed to plant a colony on Roanoke Island off the coast of North Carolina. The settlers on Roanoke Island had mysteriously disappeared around 1590. To this day, no one knows what happened to them. At this point, England was at war with Spain and might have postponed colonization for some time had it not been for two of the greatest spin doctors of the Elizabethan age, two cousins, both named Richard Hakluyt. The Hakluyts believed England's future greatness would be based on overseas colonies. In a series of massive books and reports, they implored the crown to expel the Spanish papists from North America, convert the Indians to Protestantism, and begin trading with them. The Hatlutes described an America where the earth would produce things in abundance, as in the Garden of Eden, without toil or labor. Those are their words. 
When a company of gentlemen adventurers was finally sent to Virginia in 1607, they apparently took the cousins at their word and died in appalling numbers. But the struggling colony was saved, but just barely, by the soldierly discipline of a swashbuckling captain we'll meet in our next lecture. John Smith's mission was to make certain that in America, the 17th century would be England's century.